We uh, see the church empowered to do what God, the Lord Jesus Christ, called them to do in the first chapter, and that is for them to be witnesses unto Him both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now remember, the gospel is in view. The command, this great commission that has been given to the church is in view. They were told to wait for the promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost to come down. Again, for the purpose of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we must not lose sight of that. Uh, and if we're not careful, we will, uh, I believe, misunderstand and uh, misapply the second chapter. Notice Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? What meaneth this? There are three times in our text that we find the word all or every repeated. The first time it is talking about how all of the believers who were gathered there, the 120 that we find in the first chapter that were gathered together in the upper room, the Bible says they were all in one accord. Then the Bible tells us a few verses later that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And the later the Bible says that all those that heard what was going on, the Bible says they were all amazed. I want to preach a message this afternoon that I've entitled, Ready, Filled, and Amazed. We now come to the day of Pentecost. The, by the way, this day that has been anticipated by the church, uh, by these gather, people gathered together expecting for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come down. And this is a, was also a significant day to the Jews, the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was one of the many Jewish feasts. It was called Pentecost because it took place 50 days after the Passover. This offering, uh, the, 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 this offering in this feast was the first two loaves made from the portion of the wheat harvest of the year, and it was given to the Lord as a thank offering. If you study through the Old Testament, particularly the book of Exodus, you will find this same feast called the Feast of Harvest. Or you will also see, see it called the Feast of Weeks, or also named the Day of the First Fruits. In the Old Testament, the fast of Pentecost commemorated the wheat harvest, and after the exile, it became the traditional festival where Israel remembered the giving of the law of Moses. To this day, Orthodox Jews still keep this feast. They offer prayers, and in their synagogues, they read publicly the Old Testament account of the giving of the law of Moses as recorded in Exodus 
Then from the prophets, they read the first chapter of Ezekiel and the third chapter of Habakkuk and also the second chapter of Joel. But this day would be special for another reason. And that is for uh, the working of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God that was promised, by the way, prophesied by John the Baptist before Jesus Christ was baptized, was prophesied by Jesus Christ Himself, was promised by Jesus Christ and announced before His departure, before He was to be betrayed in John chapter 14, 16, and 17, the promise of the Comforter. And then Jesus Christ, before His ascension, commanded them to uh, remain there at Jerusalem until the promise of His coming. And so this day has been anticipated, it's been promised, it's been prophesied, and here is this day come. Now how did this come about? When we read about through the book of Acts, we are interested in this, and I hope that our hearts is in the same place, that we are interested not in 21st century Christianity, but that we are interested in 1st century Christianity. And as we read through the book of Acts, that's what you find. You find the first century Christians, those who uh, were part here of this day of Pentecost and who would go on in the few chapters, we'll see, to turn the world upside down. To the amazement, by the way, of all of the world. To the amazement of the religious leaders there who were in Jerusalem. You remember, they claimed that these people were ignorant and foolish men, but they had taken notice that they had been with Jesus. And as we read through the book of Acts, we ask ourselves, how is it possible that a group of what the world would refer to as ignorant men would get to the place where they turn the world upside down? There's only one answer possible. The world was turned upside down, not because of what they did, but because of what God did to them, in them, and through them. Isn't that what the book of Acts is about? If you go to the first chapter, I want you to notice, remember the first verse, the Bible says of Acts 1, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. You see, what Jesus Christ started in the Gospels, as He said in Matthew chapter number 16, He told His disciples, I will build My church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And when we look at Acts chapter, uh, or we study through the book of Acts, we find exactly Jesus Christ doing that. Him building His church. He did not look at Peter and say, tell Peter, Peter, you will build My church. Neither did He say, I will build your church. He said, I will build My church. As a matter of fact, when we read the day of Pentecost, we must remember that this is... The moving of God. It is not the moving of man. It is the moving of God in the lives of men who would result in the moving of God through the lives of these same men. And notice as do we look at the emphasis of this first chapter when they were proclaiming and many people make a, a, a big deal and we ought to about the tongues that were being spoken and the people that heard it in their own language. But again, what were they speaking? The Bible tells us the wonderful works of God. They were not talking and going back to the Old Testament and talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They were talking about everything that God had done. Much like what Jesus Christ did in Luke chapter 24. You remember after He rose from the dead, He, read the, he met the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And what did He say to them? He, be, he expounded unto them the Scriptures, the things concerning Himself. And as He went, the Bible says, He began with the law and Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, the things concerning Him. You see, the Bible and the revelation and the record of God's Word is a record of the work of God. And now in Acts chapter number 2, we see that God is not done. God is still active. God is still working uh, in man, and He still desires to work through man. And I believe it is still the case today. God is interested in working in our lives so that He can work through our lives. 
Now before we begin with the message that the Lord's laid on my heart, I want to uh, pose this question here because this is pertinent to our hour and there is a, a group of churches who have really mishandled this portion of Scripture and who have called and entitled what is happening here the baptism of fire. They've called this the baptism of fire when you find here uh, these uh, uh, believers speaking in the tongues of men. Now when we consider the working of the Spirit of God in the lives of men, we have to ask ourselves this question, what does it look like? If we would go through the entirety of the Word of God, if we go through even history, when God works in the lives of men, what does it look like? I'll tell you what it looks like. There is a change of heart. And consequently, a change of principles, of desires, of inclinations and affections that uh, perceptibly follow thereupon. You see, when the moving of God takes place, there is always, there is always an inward working of God's Holy Spirit in the hearts of men by the Word of God. Today, there are many strange things happening in churches all across our land and the world. Many of these things are falsely attributed to the Holy Spirit of God. Even many people claim and go so far as to say, the day of Pentecost happened again. Today you could read, and by the way, you can find these things so easily today. You find people who say uh, and speak of Pentecost and speak of the working of the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, what you look at the church service is a bunch of people falling down on the ground and rolling around. And people say that is the Spirit of God. Is it? You find in certain churches people are feigning as they're being touched by some preacher standing on the platform. Often you will find people utter senseless, repetitious noise uh, that is indiscernible to human language. You have uh, even people now who have uh, uh, laughing revivals where people bark like dogs and laugh uncontrollably and they will say something like this, We had the day of Pentecost again. Can I say that is not what happened on the day of Pentecost? Far from it. Those things happening are always attributed today to the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Many claim this second chapter of Acts is a record of some believers being baptized with fire. Now the truth is, as you read Acts chapter number 2, there's nothing said about anything about the baptism of fire. Nothing at all. Uh, the only time you find this uh, 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 idea given is if you go back with me to Matthew chapter number 3. I want you to turn there with me, and this is important before we go to our text, to dispel some of the uh, false and the lies that are being propagated out there. In Matthew chapter number 3, the Word of God gives us some important answers as to what does it mean here to be baptized with fire. And often people ascribe that and they say that that is a positive thing. Often will, uh, people will even say that in order to be saved that you need to be baptized with fire. What does that mean? Well, in Matthew chapter number 3 here, John the Baptist has been preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and his message is very simple. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you go down with me to verse number 5, the Bible says, Then went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the, the regions round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Notice verse number 7 of Matthew chapter number 3. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And notice verse number 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost 
and with fire. Now often people will say, well see, uh, uh, the day of Pentecost was the baptism of the Holy Ghost and it was a baptism of fire. Now that's what they say. The only problem is we go back to Matthew chapter number 3, you have to always look at the context. I want you to go with me to the next verse, verse 12. Notice the Bible says, or Matthew 3, notice verse number 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the, the, the gardener, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now what is interesting is you find here, as the, this phrase at the end of verse 11, that when Jesus Christ comes, or the Holy Ghost comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Uh, these are not complementary, they are in contrast. In other words, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is to be contrasted with the baptism of fire. How do we know that? Because of the verses in between, the, or uh, the, the verses it finds in between. Notice verse 10. As he talks about fire, what type of fire is he talking about? The judgment of God. Notice verse 10 again. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Is that a good fire or a bad fire? That's a bad fire. It speaks of the judgment of God. He just called the scribes and the Pharisees vipers. Generation of vipers. And then notice again in verse 12, whose fan is in his hand. What's, what is that talking about? The book of Revelation, the judgment of God. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so when we read about the fire, the baptism of fire in verse number 11, that's not a good baptism. That's a bad one. You see, Jesus Christ... Uh, would come and he would live this life and John the Baptist is there's preaching but there's coming somebody who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The first one is the good baptism of the Holy Ghost. The second one is a bad baptism. It speaks of the judgment of God and the context shows us that clearly. In each of these verses and the immediate context specifically refers to fire as judgment. The same is true in Luke chapter number 3. He again looks to the scribes and the Sadducees who basically, as uh, John the Baptist was baptizing the people in Judea, people were coming, they were repenting of their sins, but guess who was not repenting? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were refusing to repent. And so John the Baptist looked at them and he says, "Ye generation of vipers, the judgment of God is coming. And so you will either be baptized by the Holy Ghost or you will be baptized with fire. The only time that only the baptism of the Holy Ghost is found is in Mark chapter number 1. I want you to go there with me because in Matthew and Luke we find the same record, but then in Mark there is a variation as far as he does not mention the baptism of fire. Notice in Mark chapter 1 verse number 8. The Bible says here, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. But then he doesn't mention, and with fire. Now why is that? Because of the context. The context of Mark, the people in Judea were repenting and were getting baptized by John the Baptist. But in the context of Matthew and Luke, he mentions the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Mark, he doesn't mention them. And so he mentions the baptism of fire because in Matthew and Luke because he's addressing uh, the, uh, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, but in Mark he's only referring to the crowd who was repenting and baptized, being baptized by John. And so because of the context, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not mentioned. Only they of Jerusalem, verse 5, were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. You see... The baptism of fire is clearly a reference to judgment. The baptism of the Holy Ghost was a sign to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. The Jews for the most part rejected the message and we know that some years later Titus overran Jerusalem, destroyed the city, burning the temple and killing more uh, one million Jews. Some have attributed that to the baptism of fire, the judgment of God because the Jews had rejected the Messiah and the first century church. But the ultimate fulfillment of the baptism of fire points to the lake of fire that is mentioned in Revelation. So the baptism of the fire, understand, anybody that says today that you need to be baptized with fire does not understand what the baptism of fire is. It is the judgment of God.
And by the way, you do not want to be baptized with fire. And so with that said, I want to uh, dispel because that is the only scriptures where it is mentioned in Matthew's account and in Luke's account and is not mentioned in correlation with the believers being baptized by the Holy Ghost. It mentions nothing about them being baptized with fire. What is the baptism of the Spirit? I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul uh, instructs the believers at the church at Corinth. And notice in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, if you go down with me to verse number 12, the Apostle Paul explains the doctrine of the Spirit of God. And he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Notice verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been uh, all made to drink into one Spirit. And so we find here clearly the baptism of the Spirit is for those here uh, who... Uh, Notice, by one spirit we are baptized into one body. That's speaking of the body of Christ. There is no Jew or Gentiles in the church. Whether we be bond or free, we have been all made to drink into one spirit. That is the baptism of the spirit. We are uh, ushered into uh, and known as the people of God. Now understand who he's talking about. That's the church at Corinth. Remember, these were the believers, according to chapter 1, who were divided. These were the same believers, according to chapter 2, who were called carnal Christians. These are the believers in chapter 6 who were taking each other, using the law against one one another, and taking each other to court. These were the same believers who had corrupted the Lord's Supper in chapter number 11. These believers, however, were saved people. How do we now know that? Because of chapter 6. I want you to go back with me there in chapter number 6, and I want you to notice in verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, the Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And here it is, And such were some of you. I like this. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, for I will not be brought under the power of any. And so we find that these were people who had been washed. They had been sanctified. But how was that possible in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God? And so these were believers who had again received of the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit takes place the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have the earnest of the Spirit. You have the indwelling Spirit of God. You are sealed by the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. And we become the temples of God. Now, that's important. And I wanted to mention all those things because of the confusion that is going on out there and the mishandling of Scripture that often people uh, do to look at this second chapter. And I believe often people miss the big picture. What is chapter 2 about? Well, I want you to notice those three things that I mentioned earlier. By way of introduction, uh, these people were ready. We find them to be filled. And then we find the world amazed. I want you to notice, first of all, the preparation for Pentecost. If you notice as we begin chapter 2 in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, here is, here's a picture of those believers. Here's what God tells us was the spirit of the place. They were all... Now the word all is a complicated word. It means all. <laughs> Every single one. Without doubt. Now that's what? The 120... All of them, notice, were with one accord in one 
place. And here I believe this is one of the prerequisites here for these people to be used of God because that's what we find in the first chapter. The first chapter tells us they were in one accord. In the second chapter, as the day of Pentecost comes, they are in one accord. And as you continue to read through the book of Acts, the Bible repeatedly says they were in one accord. Whether it was with the breaking of bread, whether it was in prayers, these people were in one accord. Accord, And so here is the preparation for Pentecost. And here, how valuable it is for us as God's people in this world if we're going to carry on the work of God before God can do a work in our lives so that He can do a work through our lives, we have to make sure we have the right mindset. We have to make sure that we're all going in the same direction. We have to make sure that we all have submitted ourselves to God and that we are ready for God to work in our lives and through our lives. You see, what is described in this record is not an event that is to be repeated or duplicated as in the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God came down, not only and dwelt the believer, but then there was a, a manifestation of, of a, an outward a miracle that took place, not only in the people who were performing this miracle, but the people who were hearing the message. Nor should we as God's people ask for God for another day of Pentecost. As we have seen, this special day was a prophesied event by Old Testament prophets, by John the Baptist, and by Jesus Christ. Although what God did at Pentecost is not an event that needs to be repeated, there are some important qualities that we observe in the believers gathered together on that special day that I believe we can duplicate as believers. I want you to notice as we consider the preparation for Pentecost, we go back to the first chapter, uh, there was this moment of waiting, this moment of anticipation. And the Bible says that all of them were in one accord. They were expecting God to do something. I want you to notice the areas in which they were prepared for. First of all, they were one in commission. If you go back to uh, verse 1 of the first chapter of Acts, the Bible says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. A few verses later, the Bible says, Jesus Christ commanded them to remain at Jerusalem until the promise of the Father come. And then we read in verse number 8, the Bible says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Do you understand here as the believers were gathered together in the upper room, they were one in commission. What Jesus Christ began in the Gospels is to be continued. And Jesus Christ gives them a final command, by, and is as simple as it gets, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And they did that. But wait for the promise of the Father in order to do what? To be His witnesses. That, that, that's why they were to wait. You see, they needed the power of God to do the work of God. And so they were one in commission. Those people were not just wondering, well, I wonder what's going to happen when Pentecost comes. They knew what was going to happen when Pentecost comes. When the power comes down, you will be witnesses. That is what's going to happen. And so they were one in commission. And we have to understand today, in the 21st century, the reason why the New Testament church exists is for the same purpose that the first century church existed. And that is to preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. The commission has not changed, and we ought to be one in commission. And until there's a group of believers who understand that, who says we have one focus, we have one work that God is called us, calling us to do, understand, we do not exist to start yoga classes. We do not exist to start some a community program. We exist to preach the gospel to the lost. Amen. That's why we exist. And these believers here, they were one in commission. If we read the conclusion of Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, uh, verse 19, the Bible says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And the Bible kind of summarizes the book of Acts in the last verse of Mark 16 by saying this, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following Amen. Mark sums up, she says, what happened when Pentecost, we know they waited for 10 days between His ascension and when, and when the promise of the Holy Ghost came down. What happens after that? The Bible tells us they preached everywhere. What did they preach? 
I'll tell you what they preach, the gospel. And we'll see what they preach. The message is quite clear. And so we see that they were one in commission. But also the second thing we notice is that they were one in supplication. The first time the Bible uh, enlightens to us to the unity of those believers is found in the first chapter in verse number 14. Notice the Bible said this, These all continued with one accord, and here it is, in prayer and supplication. They were not only one in commission, they knew what God had called them to do, but they were one in supplication. You know what that means? They were all praying for the same thing. They knew what God was going to do, they knew the promise, they didn't know how it was going to happen, but they knew it was going to happen, and they were anticipating it to happen, and they were praying together fervently for God to do a work. Remember, they had just said, some of the disciples asked Him after His resurrection, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the time. And then right after that, He says, you're going to be witnesses. And so what do you think they were praying for? What Jesus Christ told them to be concerned about. They were one in commission. They were one in supplication. Thirdly, they were one in location. Now, that may seem insignificant, but I believe it is very significant. In chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, and here it is, in one place. They had a church meeting. They were all gathered in the same place. Uh, they, they were all congregated together. Why? Because they understood that God had called them as a congregation to do His work and they were meeting in one location. With, by the way, it shows us the importance of the church meeting. The importance. The only way that a church is going to remain with one mind, with one accord, doing the work of God and together in supplication is when the church is in one place. Now, I am grateful for technology. I'm grateful that we can broadcast our meetings and our services and do all those things and the Bible Institute classes and all those things. I'm grateful for those things. But these are never a substitute for the church meeting. I was really troubled when I wrote one of my... A representative in my local district and uh, his simple reply when I asked if uh, uh, to encourage the governor to open the churches back up he basically said well you have online don't you and my simple expression is it's not the same thing it's not the church meeting these believers here were gathered together notice in one place they were together we find, notice, they were one in commission, they were one in supplication, they were one in location, but also, the fourthly, they were one in submission. Now, in chapter number 1, verse number 4, you remember the Bible says, "...in being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me." And so the Bible says here, "...he commanded them." You know what the word command means? It requires a submission on the part of the one who's listening. We don't like the word command. We don't like even the word submit. Now, I like to say that to my children. <laughs> I said this, you do it. You better submit. But when it comes to us and God says, this is what I command, you must submit. The truth is, those believers submitted to the command of God. They waited for ten days for the promise of His coming. And during what, what their waiting time, in chapter 1, if you go down with me, uh, notice to verse number 15, the Bible says, in those days, that means the waiting period, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, here it is, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which is guide to them that took Jesus. And so here it is. The Bible says here they were gathered together. They're obeying the Lord. They're submitted to the command of Jesus Christ. And what does Peter do? He says, the Scriptures. The Scriptures must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. You know what that means? We find a group of people who gathered together and who were willingly submitting themselves to the Word of God. The Word of God. We ask ourselves here, who was their authority? I'll tell you who was their authority. Jesus Christ and His Word. That has not changed in the 21st century. 
The authority of the Lord Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. The Bible makes it very clear. Jesus Christ, He is the head of the church. And that in all things, He might have the preeminence. What did Paul uh, encourage his son in the faith, Timothy, to do? He told him, preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke with all our suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. But after themselves shall they, eat, uh, uh, shall they uh, have uh, teachers having itchy ears. And so we understand, what is the church today? What does a, a New Testament church look like? I'll tell you, it is a church that is led by the Lord Jesus Christ and that is submitted to the Word of of God. Amen. What we find today in the 21st century is a bunch of churches who've decided to do their own program. They've placed Jesus Christ on the sideline. They've placed His picture on the wall. And then they've said, well, we've found a 21st century to do the work of God. They've changed their music. They've changed their message. They've changed everything. And they've pretended to be the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. The only valid church alive today is the church that has submitted himself to his program, not that has come up with its own program. So we find the preparation for Pentecost. They were one in commission, one in supplication, one in location, one in submission. But also we see secondly the power at Pentecost. Notice what happens if we move to verse 2. The Bible says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, and of every nation under heaven. How do we know that? Because it was the day of Pentecost. Well, what happened? Jews from around the world would come this time of the year to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And so there were Jews who, who spoke the language of those foreign lands who would come back every year to Jerusalem to observe this special feast. And now all of these uh, Jews are hearing uh, these uh, Galileans speak in their own tongues. The Bible says two things. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Understand here, uh, it doesn't say there was a wind. It says, as a rushing mighty wind. In other words, perhaps it sounded like it was a mighty rushing wind. But you know what it was? It was the Spirit of God. It's, it was not the typical wind, if you would, the wind that we see today, that we experience in this uh, state is, you know, uh, is horizontal. But this wind was vertical. It came from heaven. It came from God. The Bible also said, and then there was cloven tongues like as a fire. Understand, it was not literal fire. It was like as fire. The word cloven means divided or part or partition. Not that the tongues themselves were divided, but rather that each tongue that was being spoken on these believers was all divided. In other words, there was different tongues going on. Different known uh, languages going on at the same time. An important sign took place that is familiar to us. If you remember in Matthew chapter 3, at our Lord Jesus Christ's baptism, uh, John the Baptist was announcing uh, Jesus Christ and His coming. And the Bible says in uh, Matthew chapter 3 verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of Him. But John forbade Him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So understand what happened here. The baptism of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God coming down as a dove upon Jesus Christ was God's stamp of approval upon His only begotten Son. And the world was there as a witness 
that God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And what followed this great manifestation in the words of God, the miracles of Jesus Christ, His healing, His multiplying of the food, His preaching and His teaching, all the things that were prophesied accompanied, but it took place after His baptism and after the Spirit of God came down. And so it is in Acts chapter number 2, just as the Spirit of God coming down upon the only begotten Son of God in, in Matthew chapter 3, so it is uh, that the Holy Spirit of God came upon this first century church to testify to the world, these are my people. This is my church. And what happened after that? The signs and the miracles that accompanied as a sign to the Jewish nation that these were the people of God. You see, God recognized on this day who His people were. When Jesus Christ in Matthew 16 said, I will build my church, why did He say that way? Did they have other churches during that time? They did. But He said, my church, which distinguished His congregation from all other congregations. And so that distinction is clearly made here in Acts chapter number 2 where the Spirit of God comes down upon those believers who are gathered in the upper room. And what was that? It was the power of God. There's one more thing we find, and that is the purpose of Pentecost. Now do we see here clearly the preparation for Pentecost. They were ready. Also we see the power at Pentecost, the moving of God upon them so that He could use them. But also we see thirdly the purpose of Pentecost. What was this purpose? Here it is clear in our text verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So notice Jews had come back for the day of Pentecost for the special feast from other nations. They spoke other languages. We call that the diaspora. And they were coming back for this special feast. Verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are uh, not uh, all these things speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So understand what happened on the day of Pentecost was not a group of 120 people babbling senseless words. What happened on the day of Pentecost was a clear speech that took place in a known language to Jews who had traveled from other countries in their foreign languages who had come to Jerusalem and who heard these people declaring the wonderful works of God in their own language. That's what happened. The Bible tells us, notice as he mentions all those different countries, 16 are mentioned there. And notice the Bible tells us here in verse number 11, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues. Here it is, the wonderful works of God. So, I think we can all testify that what took place on that day was pretty amazing. And I'm certain that there's part of us who would say, well, I wish I was there to see how all this happened and how this, all this unfolded. And how, 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 how did it happen? How, how did God move? But the truth is, what took place on the day of Pentecost is what always taken place. God revealed Himself to man. Often people, they go crazy and they go, oh, look, all those known in tongues and they get carried away with all the things and all. Oh, look at the chaos. No, there was no chaos. It was clear as could be. The Word of God was being preached. The works of God were being declared just as Jesus had just done in Luke chapter 24 after His, resur after his resurrection, before His ascension. He took apart His disciples and He expounded to them. He began at Moses and He walked to, through the prophets and He went through the Psalms and He expounded to them all the things concerning himself and he traced as uh, Paul does in Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11 he traces the history of Israel and through all that what does he remind them of? The work of God. What is this church about? It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. What is it about? It's about the work of God. Well, what is our message? We declare the wonderful works of God. What is interesting is the word tongue that we find here in our text is only used in two ways in the Bible. 
It is either a reference to the physical tongue or to a reference to a known language. According to verse 6 and 8, the tongues mentioned in the earlier part are called later languages. So we know that these were not some things that nobody could understand. These were languages. Paul explained to the church at Corinth when they were misusing the gifts and they were a carnal people and they were boasting in their gifts which shows you they had it all wrong. And Paul writes and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 20, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. Here are some important facts for the day of Pentecost. There were 16 different countries at least that are mentioned here in Acts chapter number 2 from verse 9 to verse 11. 16. People from all over the world came to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost in verse number 5 and they spoke this, the wonderful works of God according to verse number 11. And the Bible would remind, Paul would remind the believers at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 by saying, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And then he would later tell them it is for a sign. It was a sign to the Jews. Remember what the prophecy was? You're either going to be baptized by the Holy Ghost or with fire. You're either going to find in yourself in submission to the righteousness of God or you're going to go about and establish your own righteousness and you're going to be baptized with fire. But we must not miss as believers. We find that the Bible says they were all in one accord. They were all filled. And every single person that was gathered in Jerusalem, when they heard what was going on, they saw those Galileans speaking in their languages and they thought to themselves, Galileans, there's no way they can speak all of our languages. They spoke of the wonderful words of God and the Bible says they were all amazed. The truth is, for us as believers, we have to ask ourselves those three questions. Are we ready for God to do a work in us so that He can do a work through us? If that takes place, then we have to be filled. Not that we need more of God, but that He has more of us. And that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. Are we under the control of God? Have we yielded ourselves to God? Are we ready? Are we filled? But then there's the last one is, they were all amazed. Who's amazed? Well, I know the believers were amazed, but the world was amazed. You remember when one of the religious leaders said, as he heard of the preaching of Peter, and that Jerusalem was filled with the doctrine? What did this uh, ch uh, Pharisee said? He says, look, if this be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. But if it be of men, it will just die out. Well, guess what? It was of God. And the whole world stood amazed. They turned the world upside down. They looked at these people and they thought to themselves, there's no way. There's fishermen. Uh, all of those men who, uh, ignorant, they weren't taught in the same schools that we, but there's something peculiar about them. It seems that they have been with Jesus. So in the end, it's all about Jesus Christ. We look at Acts and we say, how could this all be done? I say to you again, there is only one answer. The world was turned upside down, not because of what they did, but because of what God did to them, in them, and through them. Amen. And because of what God did, the world was amazed. You see, we have it wrong. We want the world to be amazed with us. But often we're not willing to make ourselves ready and to be yielded to Him. We want, to be, we want the world, and that's what has gone wrong with the church. The church wants the world to be enamored with their exploits. They bring in the parades, they bring in the concerts, they bring in the skits, they bring all the things to attract people, and people are clapping, and they're amazed at the parade, they're amazed at the voices, they're amazed at the performance, but God is missing! And they can't see Him. 
Why? Because God cannot work in their midst. They were never the people of God. They have not submitted themselves. And therefore the world will not be amazed by God. The world will not talk about the wonderful works of God. And may this church resemble the first century church.